Welcome to TV Tennessee Valley Church. I'm sure there's someone out there watching this who recently moved to this part of the world. Maybe your husband or wife or father or mother came home one day and out of the blue said, My company has offered me a wonderful opportunity in North Alabama. We're moving. Now, I know not everyone is thrilled about a move. Moving itself is often traumatic. But beyond that, I know what some people outside of Huntsville and North Alabama think. I don't want to move to that Hicksville of a place called Alabama. Then folks get here and love it so much, they retire here. This is a great place to live. Think back to what it was like when you learned you were moving to Huntsville or Decatur or Scottsboro or wherever you are in North Alabama, especially if you were coming for your spouse's job or your parent's job. And, and if you can imagine that, remember that, maybe you can imagine what it must have been like for Sarah. We're continuing our series on the faith of our mothers and fathers. Today, we're talking about Sarah, otherwise known as the wife of the famous Abraham. Sarah's story begins in Genesis 11. Abraham came home one day and said, Honey, today God spoke to me. I mean the real God, the big boss, as in God Almighty. I know it sounds crazy, but it was just as real as if you were talking to me. And God said, Leave your home and your father's family and go to a place I will show you. No, honey, he, he didn't say where that would be. He just said he'd show me. Sometimes God's children still have to take steps into the unknown, believing God will provide a way and that He will make some sense of it all. That's what Sarah did. Actually, Sarai is her name when it, when it first appears on the pages of Scripture. Her name later would become Sarah, and that's how we know her. The first words we read about her are found in Genesis 11, and they are simply, Abram's wife was Sarai. The second sentence about her is sad to read. Sarai was barren. She had no children. It is painfully true that in that place and time, women's value was in the producing of children. If they couldn't have babies, they were considered second class. Abraham was 75 and Sarah 65, by the way, that day when Abraham came home with big news. The big news we see in Genesis 12 that reads... God said He would bless me, announced Abraham, and to turn our offspring into a great nation. God said that He'd bless all the nations of the world through you and me. Sarah and Abraham followed God's call from Haran to Canaan, present-day Israel, with only the promise that their descendants would form a great nation. But there was a problem with that promise. They didn't have even one descendant. Remember the second sentence we read about Sarah. Sarai was barren. She had no children. And by the way, remember she was old enough to draw social security. This is where Sarah's story gets dicey. Chapter 16 begins with these words. Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. Sarah suggested Hagar, her maidservant, become her surrogate mother. In the pre-medical technology days, being a surrogate mother would require an intimate physical relationship with the father, with Abraham, Sarah's husband. That's quite unthinkable to us, but apparently very much, very much acceptable according to the customs of 2000 B.C. While Sarah's plan was not wrong according to the moral codes of her day, it it still was terribly wrong, for she felt like some finagling was required in order to complete God's plan. Remember, God said He would use the descendants of Sarah and Abraham to form a great nation. So, infertile Sarah felt like she had to manipulate things in order to bring about what God had promised. She felt like she had to scheme in order to make things work. But faith, in the words of Warren Wearsby, is living without scheming. Faith means waiting for God to accomplish what only He can accomplish without rushing ahead and trying to manipulate things. Hebrews 6.12 says that it is through faith and patience 
that we inherit what has been promised. When you and I have a dream and a chance at that dream, it's easy to want to push, to, to manipulate the situation, to work all the angles. Henry Nouwen, though, gave us an example of what it means to wait on God with trust, not pushing. Somehow, Nouwen became the friend of a trapeze artist, and the trapeze artist taught him the importance of waiting with trust. The trapeze artist talked about the moment when a flyer is caught by the catcher. The flyer lets go of his bar and is suspended in air above the nervous crowd below. The trapeze artist told Nouwen, The flyer must never try to catch the catcher. He must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him, but the flyer must wait. He cannot flail about in anxiety. In fact, if he does, it could kill him. The flyer's job is to be still, to wait, to wait for the catcher to catch him. And to wait is the hardest work of all. That's a good picture of waiting on God with trust. Sarah was unwilling to wait. She pushed and manipulated and schemed and it backfired. What began as an attempt to find a mother for her son resulted in a competitor for her husband. When Hagar became pregnant, she began to treat Sarah, her mistress, like dirt. Then Sarah, Abraham's wife, grew terribly angry with Abraham. The predictable conflict between Sarah and Hagar was so severe that Abraham ended up sending Hagar and her son and his son, Ishmael, away. For my entire life, the world has worried about the often violent conflict between Jews and Palestinians. The root of the Arab-Israeli conflict is right here in this story of Ishmael, Hagar's son, considered the second generation of the Arab family, and Isaac, Sarah's son, about whom we'll talk next week, the second generation of the Jewish family. If Sarah had only recognized that her worth came in being a child of God, not in being a baby-making machine, then she would not have tried to force things. Sarah's life and history itself would have been much different. Remember what Warren Wearsby said, Faith is living without scheming. Sarah had finagled, manipulated, and schemed in her own effort to fulfill God's plan for her and Abraham to have a son. But she need not have done all that. God Himself had a plan to fulfill His promise. In chapter 17, verse 19 of Genesis, God said to Abraham, Your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him. Unfortunately, Abraham didn't think to tell Sarah about that. Ladies, does your husband ever forget to tell you things? Well, when he does, remember that Abraham, a great man, forgot to tell his wife that God had said she was going to have a baby. Soon, Sarah and Abraham had some guests, one of whom happened to be an angel in disguise. And this angel, who looked like a man, again declared that Sarah would give birth to a baby boy. Sarah was eavesdropping from her tent, and when she heard the angel say she was going to have a son, she laughed. The angel overheard Sarah's cackle and asked Abraham, Why did your wife laugh at this? Then the, then the angel asked that penetrating question, Is anything too hard for the Lord? And this might just be the most important lesson of Sarah's story. Don't laugh at God's plans. Within the year, Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Isaac, by the way, means laughter. Sarah laughed at the preposterous proposition that she would have a child. Within the year, though, she was laughing the laughter of joy and celebration as she held that little pink promise in her arms. It seems Sarah's laughter reflected only a momentary lapse of trust. Hebrews 11, 11 says Sarah was a person of faith and says of her, she considered him faithful who had promised. When all is said and done, the Bible calls Sarah a woman of faith. And even people of faith have their moments of doubt. 
right? In a few minutes, I'll be back to talk about one of my favorite words, hope.
By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. God doesn't always bless infertile elderly ladies like Sarah with babies, but the fact that God can, that nothing is too hard for the Lord, well, that's what gives us hope. There aren't a lot of stories like Sarah's so that we don't live with unrealistic expectations. But there are a handful of stories like Sarah's in which God took His sweet time but eventually showed up with a miracle to make us people of hope, genuine hope. To choose hope is like tipping God before He delivers. Here's what I mean by that. I heard a guy complaining a couple of weeks ago about having to pay the tip before the pizza is delivered. Apparently, where he orders pizza, you have to add the tip to your credit card right there online or on the phone when you're paying for the pizza before it comes. What if the pizza arrives upside down, he complained. Well, hope is like tipping God before he delivers. It's, it's the confidence that although everything might not end up exactly as we want, God will come through. You see, hope is like tipping God before he delivers. And hope is like thanking God even before the coffee comes. Whistling Jack was a surgeon in New York City, but his drinking problem had cost him his medical practice. When Taylor Field met him, Whistling Jack was whiling away the days under a tree in a public park on the lower east side of Manhattan. And Taylor wrote about Whistling Jack, about Whistling Jack's sense of contentment. Whistling Jack said it's all about thanking God for taking care of you before He provides. If you said you were going to go across the street and buy me a cup of coffee, Whistling Jack said, I'd thank you right then. I wouldn't wait to make sure you actually brought me some. That's just courtesy. You see, hope is like tipping God before He delivers. And hope is like thanking God even before the coffee comes. Two millennia after Sarah, two millennia before you and me, an angel appeared to a virgin teenage girl. You're going to have a baby, the angel said. Are you sure? asked Mary, that teenage girl. I know I have a lot to learn, but I don't think it's supposed to happen like this. God is going to perform a miracle in your body, said the angel, and nothing is impossible with God. Isn't that a beautiful truth? Nothing is impossible with God. And the God of Abraham and Sarah became flesh and walked among humanity. We called his name Jesus. The angel in Sarah's story asked, Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the angel declared to Mary, mother of Jesus, Nothing is impossible with God. Maybe you needed to hear that. And maybe you will choose to be a person of hope. start before the beginning of time with no point of reference you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak
of your promise You don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void For once you have spoken All nature and science follow the sound of your voice As you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see.
Tennessee Valley Church means church has left the building. So has membership. Here's what I mean. You might be feeling a need or maybe even a call from God to be part of our church family in a more tangible way. If you're not able to join us physically here at 600 Governors Drive, whether because of distance, mobility, schedule, or some other reason, you still can be a member of First Baptist Huntsville. Let me send you information on what that would mean, what you could expect from your church, and what your church would expect from you. Email me at travis at fbchsv.org. Let me know of your desire for membership and I'll help you get started. Join hands with us as we attempt to join hands with God Himself in His mission to the world.